You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with experts and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And as the U.S. and its allies continue to respond to Russia's incursion into Ukraine and the escalating economic sanctions, India is one of the biggest nations that has yet to condemn Russia's actions. And they are throwing in with Russia economically in a variety of ways. In today's conversation, we'll explore India's pivotal role in the conflict. What is India's relationship with Russia? What is India's relationship with China? What will all of this mean for the global economy? Joining me today is Dr. Lori Esposito Murray. Uh, Dr. Murray is the president of the Committee for Economic Development which is the public policy arm of the conference board, but she also is an international uh, relations expert and a security expert. Lori, thanks for joining us today. Oh, Steve, thank you for asking me to join in this very important conversation. So Lori, just, let's just start with India's historical relationship with Russia and the USSR. Describe how that's played out over the years. Well, it's a really important question because there's a lot of focus right now uh, on uh, India's relationship with Russia because of the oil trade. Uh, There's also a lot of emphasis, uh, uh, needless to say, on India's neutrality. And it's really important to look at and understand the the historic relationship with Russia uh, in order to understand what neutrality actually means in this current crisis with Ukraine. And um, you know, shortly after independence, uh, India embraced neutrality, declaring that its interests were best served by a non-aligned policy. Uh, you know, they were breaking free uh, of British rule, uh, imperialism, and a non-aligned policy was uh, how they were defining their role uh, as an independent nation in the world. Uh, but as Soviet Uh, Chinese relations began to splinter in the 1950s. India started to develop closer economic and security ties with Russia in order to counter the threat uh, from historic rivals of China on one border, and then, of course, uh, Pakistan, uh, its its new neighbor on the other border. And uh, India's relationship with Russia, uh, particularly its dependence on Russian military hardware, deepened in the 1970s. This was the period where the U.S. was doing its openings to China. Both Russia and India felt that they were left out uh, of this uh, new arrangement and they were going to be outsiders uh, as the U.S. was was, uh, developing under President Nixon a very new approach uh, to the world order by opening to China and also trying to solve the Vietnam crisis. And so India and and, uh, Russia actually codified their relationship with the uh, signing of a formal uh, peace and friendship treaty in the early 1970s. And that really has been uh, the uh, foundations of uh, India's relationship with the new Russia as well, uh, you know, after the Soviet Union collapse. It's 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 a strong historical relationship. India's needed it to help balance uh, its relationship with China, its its contentious uh, border problems, uh, and it's also needed its friendship uh, in terms of dealing with its its, uh, arch rival, Pakistan. Yeah, now, you know, the subject of this is not China, but you you can't talk about Russia and India without also mentioning China as the, the third leg of the stool. Just briefly, you know, India's relationship with China has not been all that friendly over time. So this new triumvirate is 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 a little strange. Uh, it's a little strange, but it also has a very strong economic base. China is uh, second uh, to the United States in terms of its trade relationship with India. Russia is, even though the military trade is extremely important, is far behind uh, in terms of uh, trade relations with India. So that friendship or uh, with 
Russia became really important as the, as the interdependence in terms of the uh, economic relationship with China was growing. And finding commonality strategically was also really important. Both China and Russia were becoming strategically aligned, developing uh, their friendship, so to speak, uh, limited, uh, unlimited friendship in term, because they share strategic goals. And, and in that strategic approach, India actually fits in. Uh, India, you know, in its non-aligned um, status, agrees uh, with the strategic approach of lessening the um, importance of the U.S. dollar uh, in, in uh, international commerce and, and finance, and, uh, and consequently also diminishing the, the international influence of the United States as a lead, global leader. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, India calls itself non-aligned, but then they are aligned. I mean, you know, you have to, you can't just say you're non-aligned in a global economy and, you know, with global supply chains and, and now with some of these packs that have gone on. You, you know, um, you've talked about uh, President Putin's trip to visit Mr. Modi in December and some of the agreements there, maybe you could share, you know, what happened with that visit. Yeah, and that, that's a really interesting visit and the timing of it is really interesting. And just as a backdrop in terms of the Putin-Modi relationship, Modi is one of only four foreign leaders that has been awarded Russia's top decoration, the Order of St. Andrew. And uh, he was he was honored with that award uh, by Putin. Uh, they have deepened their relationship uh, during Putin's time in power since 2000 and Modi's time in power after that. You know, they have deepened their relationship. Uh, and the Modi-Putin relationship is, is particularly important. But so what, what's interesting about the December visit is that it was happening uh, after the U.S. very much was uh, broadcasting globally, not only in terms of private meetings with allies and partners, but sharing U.S. intelligence uh, uh, publicly and globally about the threat of uh, Russia invading uh, Ukraine, and that we believe that Russia would be invading Ukraine, and reaching out to our allies and partners since November. And so the December Putin-Modi trip happens under that, that shadow, and uh, Putin is greeted warmly by Modi, uh, and they end up um, striking um, a number of very important deals, both in oil and uh, in, in terms of uh, contracts on oil and increasing their their oil um, imports in 2022 specifically. But uh, stepping back, they also it foreshadowed the China uh, meeting with Xi Jinping in February, just before the Olympics. Uh, as the Olympics were opening, Modi and Putin signed a 99-point joint statement on partnership for peace, progress, and prosperity. Putin goes to China and does the same thing with China in terms of uh, having a limitless uh, relationship and a very long uh, statement of the coalescing of their strategic goals and their friendship. So you see it happening in India first. And then uh, the agreements included, as I mentioned, uh, agreements in terms of uh, uh, upping to 2 million tons of oil to India by the end of 2022. It included uh, increases in coal imports, uh, as well as steel, shipbuilding, and of course, uh, the military trade issue uh, and the uh, surface-to-air missiles uh, that Russia had been um, promising India and working on with India since 2016 to sell the S-400s, which uh, is a system of particular concern to the United States. They actually codified that deal and um, uh, set the actual uh, import of those systems uh, in, in motion and committed to a 10-year um, continued military relationship, as well as codifying that they wanted to increase trade from about $8 billion to about $35 billion, uh, by 2035. So pretty significant agreements, uh, really locking in that relationship, and very similar to what uh, Putin achieves with Xi Jinping uh, in China uh, a couple of months later. Yeah, and so this independence is you know, a little bit of a head-scratcher. Um, and, and India has always been relatively quiet about that, you, you know, and, and low key. And but this was this was different. So after the Ukraine invasion, Russia, of course, had the energy uh, embargoes put on by the West. And so they had extra they have extra oil and gas. And uh, Mr. Modi raised his hand and very noisily said, we'll take it at below market rates, ship it here. And you don't tend to see that coming from India, which means that there's a change here. Is that just, you know, that, that's a little different than 
the history in India? Is that just you know, Mo, Mr. Modi? Is he you know is is it to to try to tell the world something or what? How do you read this? Uh, well, you have to put it in perspective of the historical friendship that they've had. So it's not it's it's not an aberration from uh, India Indian policy towards the Soviet Union and the, and then the new Russia. There is a particular relationship that's really important between Modi and Putin. I think there's a relationship of of respect and friendship. And uh, there is a, a particular dependency, even though India has been trying to diversify its uh, military um, purchases to uh, where the US actually had come in second at, at one point a year or so ago and French and France and Israel are involved and it's now uh, gone from 65% of um, Russian uh, military dependency to imports to about 49%. But given that, it's still very it's a still very important relationship, and you also have to maintain those systems as well. And they committed, as I said, to 10 years out. So, but what what they are doing is and arguing uh, what they are doing from um, the uh, Indian foreign minister is that. Oil sales are only one to two percent of their imports. There's a bargain out there. Uh, they're getting bargain prices. They're getting help with cost of insurance and shipping. And it it is in their national interest as a uh, major importer of oil uh, to f- try and find a a bargain uh, for their. Uh, country, their economy, and their people. That's that's the argument. The U.S. is asking because, as you know, uh, there is no, um, there are no sanctions on oil and gas uh, except for th- what the U.S. has imposed uh, independently uh, on our own uh, imports. There are no sanctions. The U.S. position has been to ask. Uh, India to ask Modi directly, and President Biden did this apparently or reportedly in his conversations with Modi, not to accelerate the sale of uh, Russian oil. According to Reuters data, uh, they have actually uh, imported just about as much oil since the um, uh, since the invasion of Ukraine as they did in all of 2021, and uh, so. Uh, there's been a significant acceleration, although at this point, India is arguing that it's, it, it isn't going uh, above what it, yet what it has uh, usually imported. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, Russia's relationship with other nations tends to be focused on like-minded people, like-minded nations uh, politically. So, you know, you see other communist nations throwing in with Russia, the Venezuelas, the Cubas, China's in this case. India is a little different because it is a democracy with a well-established legal system. It's a nation of shopkeepers, very capitalist. So the idea that India would would align itself with this type of economic system is a bit of a head scratcher. What do you read in that? Well, it's very significant, as you mentioned, the fact that India is the longest standing uh, democratic nation, which actually I think is is equally as concerning as its uh, economic relations with with, uh, Russia right now during the sanction regime, is that India as the longest standing democracy is actually lending a tremendous amount of credibility and and really undermining the narrative of the West that this is autocratic. You know, autocracy versus democracy. When you have a, a the longest standing uh, democracy uh, in the world, uh, actually uh, tipping towards uh, Russia. So, you know, that's that's a a really important point. The other thing is that it is important to point out that India is straddling. <laughs> it is, uh, although it's tipping towards Russia, it is straddling in this. Uh, neutrality position. And I say that because it continues to be uh, the linchpin of the U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And so Prime Minister Modi has actually made a strong point, as his foreign minister has, about the importance of democracies, <laughs> you know, the natural friendship with, with the U.S. But his trade relationship with the U.S. is absolutely significant. There's $112 billion of trade uh, with, with India, and this is, you know, which dwarfs the Russian trade at about $8, $8 billion, uh, even if it grows to the $30 billion that they're talking about uh, by 2035. And of course, that's followed by China with $110 billion in trade, which has grown significantly just in 2021. So you have India economically really straddling uh, needing to have uh, good relations with uh, both Russia uh, or among Russia, China, and the U.S., 
uh, and, it, and it is straddling its policies uh, you know, to do that. Uh, it's defining its neutrality in the UN as uh, abstaining on these votes, uh, uh, which has really concerned you know, the US uh, in terms of um, uh, the signals that it's sending Russia and, and, that, and the pressure that we're trying to put on Russia. But what's interesting is that in the vote on um, removing Russia from the Human Rights uh, Commission, the UN Human Rights Commission, China actually moved to vote against that. So India and China have been both abstaining. China actually moved to vote against that. And India maintained its position of abstention and actually criticized the uh, brutality that took place in Bucha, although it did not mention Russia by name, it actually called for an investigation and criticized the the um, uh, butchery that actually took place, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's it's a straddling, uh, and I also think that that the humanitarian piece of this uh, may be a turning point in, for India um, uh, if. We ask, you know, if if the uh, war escalates uh, to Russian use of uh, conventional weapons. Right, but we haven't seen that so far. We've talked a little bit about India's historical relationship with Russia. Next, we'll talk about this unique geopolitical axis between India, Russia, and China. We'll take a short break and be right back with my conversation with Dr. Lori Esposito Murray. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world, and how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined by Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, the president of CED, the Public Policy Center of the Conference Board. So, Lori, we have to talk about this this new axis. I mean, you know, you've got Russia, China, and India. Now, China and India have had skirmishes on their borders. They've not been very friendly uh, historically. Is this President Putin's doing in order to to put three large population, three large economies, the dominant, you know, the dominant economies of Asia together? and create a new axis. And Steve, that is on point and it's been happening for over a decade uh, in terms of trying to build that access, uh, you know, a, a, an access against uh, US leadership, the West, uh, it's included the BRICS. Uh, and there are a number of forms where India and China and Russia um, actually join in terms of uh, strategic approaches to the world. Uh, there has been an effort uh, by India and China, China well, by Russia and China primarily, uh, since the Ukraine, uh, since the um, uh, Crimean uh, uh, in- invasion and, and annexation. Watching what happened with Iran being kicked out of SWIFT and after the uh, more limited sanctions, but still sanctions uh, that had an important effect on Russia in terms of signaling how Crimea was actually isolated economically. An effort by China uh, and Russia to um, develop an alternative SWIFT system as I said, watching what happened with Iran. And that's been in the works for over a decade. And, you know, the strategic approach is, is to limit the, the impact and effect uh, and primacy of the U.S. dollar. Uh, the BRICS, you know, India is as part of the BRICS, has, has been a part of that effort. And uh, Foreign Minister Lavros has actually accelerated that effort uh, in his visit in April to um, uh, move India into the nascent but still growing SWIFT system uh, that Russia has used and is using more since, obviously, it's been kicked out of SWIFT um, with the invasion of Ukraine, and uh, trying to move uh, or announcing that they were moving uh, the payment systems for India and, and uh, Russian trade into that system. China and, and Russia are talking about combining their systems. And so 
although it's it's nascent, foundations are there, and you see the uh, groundwork for an alternative swift financial system that will really fracture uh, international commerce. You've also seen, uh, I just want to add that, uh, you've also seen this switch from dollar, using the dollar in international trade by Russia, and also in terms of Russia and India, and switching to a ruble, rupee uh, exchange system. And uh, what's really fascinating is that in uh, 2013, 95% of uh, Russia's export to the BRIC countries uh, was in U.S. dollars. But between 2014 and 2019, it's it's gone down uh, significantly to uh, very, very low numbers. And what's important here is that since Modi has uh, been prime minister, uh, the rupee ruble exchanges uh, surged five times during Prime Minister Modi's tenure, increasing uh, from about 6% of total bilateral trade to 30%. And when Lavrov, Lavrov was just in India, uh, as I mentioned on April 1st, and he was the only foreign minister to, be, to meet with uh, Prime Minister Modi directly, uh, Wang Yi was not uh, from uh, China. China's foreign minister was not granted that visit. Lavrov was. And Lavrov very publicly said, we're moving to a SWIFT system or we're moving to a Rupal Ruby exchange system uh, or, or using those systems more in order to uh, continue trade uh, during these sanctions regimes. And, right. so- and, 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 and the reason you're focusing on SWIFT is that's the language, the interbank language that's used internationally, which facilitates commerce. And so by excluding countries, you you then really limit their ability to do commerce. What you're saying is that China, India, and Russia have created their own alternate system, which which facilitates, you know, their ability to interact with each other, uh, to, to trade and to pay each other, essentially, which is which is pretty important. Yeah. The other thing that you're taught, you, you keep you talk about the BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. People are now dropping the B and they're just saying the Ricks. And that's, you know, that's, you know, part and parcel of this new axis as well. Yeah. And I also just want to clarify that both uh, Russia and China have been developing alternative Swiss systems and trying and, be, you know, working together to see if they can combine them. And they're trying to bring India into that. But, you know, if, if, if you think about this whole inter, interlocked or in, inter, uh, you know, global supply chain, Western companies have, a lot of IT development, a lot of IT support, a lot of you know systems run out of India. So there's a there, that's part of that that big number uh, of trade that you talked about. They all we also are dependent on China uh, throughout the globe for our, as a manufacturing site. We also are dependent on both for minerals and you know other sources uh, related to semiconductors. And then you have Taiwan out there, and that's not the subject of today, but Taiwan produces most of the world's semiconductors. So if you start thinking about the these countries now creating their own axis that then begins to exclude the rest of the world, it puts Western-based companies in a very precarious position, doesn't it? Right. And it's, it's foreshadowing. The big question is, how does this end? Where are we going? How is the world going to be different? It's really important to, to recognize that no matter what happens on the battlefield, unless there is a uh, agreed upon negotiated uh, agreement that the U.S. and our allies and partners agree with Russia uh, and uh, on, on a peaceful settlement in Ukraine, which seems uh, close to nil at this point in terms of being a, a uh, an off ramp. You're really so. What what are you looking at? The sanctions will stay on, and if you're looking at uh, these really severe sanctions, you know the economic battle will continue. If Russia, particularly if Russia is successful militarily, the economic war, you know battlefield will continue. These sanctions will stay on, and so what what we are going to have a fractured uh, financial system. You know, Russia is out of the uh, swift messaging transactions uh, in terms of uh, financial transactions globally. And so you're going to have a fractured system. You're seeing, you know, watching how Russia is trying to uh, enhance uh, this nascent SWIFT system that it has, combine it with China, get India into that system. You're seeing how this fracture is, you're, you're, you're foreshadowing how this 
fractured economic system, what it's going to look like uh, going forward. And, and what, as you said, West, Western companies, Western governments, how are dealing with supply chains, dealing with payments? Uh, and, and are you really looking at two very different, one world, two systems, financial systems? You know, you, you can't talk about India without also mentioning Pakistan, which has been this conflict that's been going on since Pakistan was separated from India. There's still are skirmishes on the border. You've got two um, diametrically opposed uh, uh, nations, nuclear nations. Um, and, you know, the, the U.S. Has, has thrown in a little bit with Pakistan. They've been selling them arms and so forth. I and mean, is part of this whole tension between India and Pakistan and, and the U.S.'s involvement in that driving India more towards Russia? Is there, you know, how does that whole conflict play in? Um, you know, I will turn to that in just one uh, second because that is so central. But I do want to mention one other, you know, in terms of India straddling. Uh, India just uh, did sign a bilateral trade agreement with Australia. And it shows you the bind that India is in. This bilateral trade agreement is really significant uh, for Indian trade and for its relationship with Australia. And so I just wanted to mention that while, while you're watching it, lean one way, it's also so enmeshed uh, in, in the economies of the democracies in the, in the region and globally, including the US, of course. Uh, but, but turning to Pakistan, uh, that, that relationship is so central to uh, India's uh, definition of its uh, sec security. It's, it's the biggest threat it faces. I mean, it faces threats and two major threats. One is China on its border and China as a nuclear power. And it, of course, it faces this uh, uh, longstanding uh, since its birth as a, as a nation and Pakistan's birth as a nation, really intense um, uh, animosity uh, 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 that has at times even led to uh, um, uh, the potential of nuclear conflict. And so that relationship is actually central. Uh, China is, is one of, um, uh, if not the most important ally that Pakistan has. And so you see the relationship playing out that way. Uh, that makes Russia very important to India. Uh, the U.S. Uh, had closer relationships with Pakistan than it did with India. And that's in part because of India's uh, uh, decision in, uh, since the early 70s uh, to actually pursue nuclear weapons and stay out of the non-proliferation regime. And, and that was a very contentious issue between um, India and the United States. And so you see the Pakistan uh, uh, security threat, which is you know, uh, first and foremost, I believe for India, uh, playing into its relationships uh, with uh, uh, China and also its, its need for a close relationship with Russia. So, you know, just to, to try to put a bow on all of this, if it seems to me that what you're saying is that there's a complete realignment in geopolitical relations going on, and that regardless of which way the kinetic war in Ukraine happens and whether, you know, where Russia takes that, there will be an ongoing economic Cold War, a new economic Cold War. And the question is, who will be part of which piece of that? And so you see strange bedfellows here aligning uh, in a number of different ways. What is the best case in all of this, let's just say, for the United States? And what's the worst case? So uh, the best case for this is in, in terms of how this conflict, this war in Ukraine resolves itself. Uh, is clearly if um, India actually uh, embraces the sanctions regime. I mean, that would be the best case. You have two major powers. I think the best you can hope from China is that it really does sit, stay neutral. Uh, I'm not convinced you're going to see that in part because what we're looking at is uh, holding to where uh, the U.S. policy is recognizing uh, that uh, agreements and contracts exist uh, with Russia. And we're hoping in terms of neutrality that both China and India do not step in and provide the lifeline to um, uh, Putin and, and Russia. What's interesting about that is um, uh, as opposed to the Crimea conflict, um, when, it, when uh, Russia annexed Crimea, Putin actually um, signed many new agreements <laughs> 
right, right before the invasion. And so sticking to the contracts they already have were actually contracts that, that uh, Russia sealed uh, to increase trade and, and increase relations and um, uh, codify strategic relationships pri prior to, just prior to the invasion in, in, as part of their plan uh, to prepare for uh, a sanctions world that was about to uh, come down, um, uh, which we were also making really clear uh, uh, prior to the invasion, what the sanctions might, might include. So, so best case, uh, India actually embraces the sanctions regime, China stays neutral. Uh, worst case is that uh, you see a fractured one world, two systems uh, where India and China and Russia actually coalesce uh, to form, form an alternative uh, financial system. Uh, you'll still see, I think you have to see straddling in terms of uh, both China and India, given their economic uh, entrenchment in, into uh, the European and um, uh, uh, global economies. Uh, but you'll see a um, uh, retrenchment, I think, in terms of supply chains. Uh, China has already announced how it wants to become much more self-reliant. India has announced how it wants to become much more self-reliant. You're going to see a, a, a contraction uh, in terms of um, uh, what this global system looks like and a fracture of it. Yeah, so nationalism, you know, could prevail here, but it it does suggest that our that the Western companies, uh, conference board members, should be thinking about the worst case here. In which case, they really would need to find alternatives for their supply chains that are dependent on uh, India, Russia, and China. And that's that's what I hear you saying in the worst case. And you know that has already started, uh, Steve, as you know, uh, in terms of, uh, in part because of uh, the spotlight that COVID has shown on the dependencies of of single supply chains, uh, you know, coming uh, out of a single country, particularly China, that you can't get access in terms of vaccines production and and uh, uh, medicines. Um, so that's already started because of COVID. Uh, and it's really interesting. The CED has actually recommended that it's not just onshoring is actually looking for more reliable allies. And, and the IMF just came out with their recommendations in terms of supply chains and, and um, uh, Secretary Treasury Yellen has said, called it uh, friend shoring, that you, know, you need to have more reliable uh, sources for your supply chains and to look towards uh, you can't just look internally uh, because you're not necessarily really protecting yourself. I mean, look what happened at Texas uh, in terms of uh, the, the climate attack on, on its uh, ability to provide energy. Uh, so you can't just look internally, but you need to be looking for um, relations with, with closer allies and partners. Wow, Lori, it, it's always great to, to talk to you. Your insights are, are uh, amazing and in, incredibly useful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for uh, what you are doing to uh, make sure that these important conversations and insights uh, are, are discussed and are available to um, particularly the business community. Yeah, and thanks to all of our listeners for checking in with CEO Perspectives. Every week we will be joined by prominent thought leaders to discuss insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in economics, public policy, geopolitics, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues, your friends, your family. I know they'll want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by The Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from The Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.